Uh, we now go to Ms. Harmon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I recall in, a, in the last century when Ray LaHood and I had offices next to each other in the back of the back of the Cannon office building. Uh, mine, at least, was contiguous space. His was divided by some kind of uh, construction barrier. Uh, my guess is that his digs have improved. Um, I'd like to welcome this panel and, uh, and uh, say how impressed I am by your credentials and experience on this issue. You can play a big role in guiding us, uh, helping us, and helping the administration to fashion the right legislation, the right comprehensive legislation on climate change. Uh, I want to hold up my regular prop, which is the U.S. CAP Blueprint for Legislative Action. Uh, U.S. CAP is uh, testifying in the next panel, but I just I want to say how impressed I am that a diverse group of industry and environmental representatives has developed a consensus on basic principles, and then how impressed I am that this committee has used this as the basis for the bill. I just want to ask you briefly to comment on whether you agree that U.S. CAP has played an important role here and whether you agree that these consensus principles, which are not partisan, uh, are a very useful starting point. Now, let's start with Ray LaHood. I'm going to defer to these other two folks, uh, but um, uh, I know from discussing this with staff that they have played a very valuable role. Thank you. Dr. Chu. Uh, my understanding is uh, that document says, I, I haven't looked, read in detail, but my understanding mm -hmm. is that document says that uh, 14 to 20 percent uh, reduction in carbon emission by 2020 is, uh, is economically possible in the United States. And so that statement alone, coming from industry, is a very powerful statement. Secretary Jackson. I certainly agree with my colleagues. Thank you. Um, now, Dr. Chu, uh, welcome to a fellow Californian. You're Experience in California is very valuable uh, to those of us from California, but I think also to this effort since California, as everyone here knows, has been the leading state in terms of strict environmental regulation. Uh, there was a, a New Yorker article uh, in December uh, entitled, Note to Detroit, Con Consider the Refrigerator. And this is a story about you, a little profile, little picture of you here, uh, and the experience of California which set out to regulate uh, the efficiency of refrigerators. Of course, the industry objected, uh, but then uh, guess what? Uh, engineers, rather than lobbyists, figured out whether compliance was possible, and now, lo and behold, um, the size of the average American refrigerator has increased by more than 10 percent, while the price in inflation-adjusted dollars has been cut in half. Meanwhile, energy use has dropped by two-thirds. Uh, I tell this story, Dr. Chu, because you, you had a role in this. You talked about it. Uh, in this bill, uh, in the efficiency sections, we have some new bipartisan standards on uh, uh, regulating the efficiency of outdoor lighting, and we also have uh, a cash for clunkers provision, which would encourage folks to trade in old clunker refrigerators and, and appliances, trade them in, get rid of them, not plug them in in the basement. Uh, in exchange for efficient appliances, and I just welcome your thoughts and thoughts by anyone else on the panel uh, about these provisions and the experience that California has had regulating the efficiency of uh, appliances. Well, the refrigerator story is one of several stories, but in fact, uh, the efficiency has uh, has gone up so that uh, the present-day refrigerators are using one quarter of the energy they used in 1975. It was the, in fact, it was the anticipation of regulations. The regulations didn't start for several years, but as soon as uh, the manufacturers realized that they couldn't go to either party, that both parties in California strongly supported these regulations, the efficiency immediately started improving. The reason the price went down, inflation adjusted by a factor of two, was because the better insulation and the smaller compressor of the refrigerator led to a reduction in the price. Now, I cannot emphasize uh, how important this was. If you look at the energy saved today, we have a roughly 150 million refrigerators. The energy we're saving today relative to the 1974 standards are actually more energy saved than all of the wind and solar energy we're now producing in the United States, just refrigerators alone. And so we can do similar dramatic improvements in building efficiencies. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, uh, transportation building efficiencies can be even a bigger success story than refrigerators. Any other comments? Um, well, no. I can go on and on. No, I was asking <laughs> the others, uh, uh, Secretary Jackson. I'll let him go on and on. <laughs> well, he's certainly the expert, but I, I think that story is repeated over and over again that oftentimes the movement toward regulation and the call for national standards it unlocks innovation on the part. I'm an engineer, right? you know, unlocks engineers to make to move to where the market's going to be and, and unlocks the private sector investment to do it. We've seen it with cars. We've seen it with uh, the phase out of, of uh, uh, gases that affect the ozone layer. Every time we have a challenge, once we make up our mind we're going to do it, in innovation kicks in and makes it a lot cheaper and quicker usually. Than we Thank do. you so much. My time has expired. I just add that we're now seeing it with indoor lighting, which this committee uh, regulated a couple years ago, and California is moving on to clunker television sets. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Harmon. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, you know, one of the things, and, and uh, Ms. Harmon and I are working together on an incentive program to get us there. And when you look at the places where we've provided incentives, the market kicks in faster, cheaper, better. And I get a little worried that this is a huge government mandated program that is very complicated. Who's involved in the trading? Who actually determines at the end of the day what the value of CO2 or methane is? How do you quantify it? So a lot of the jobs we're talking about are going to be folks who aren't really producing anything, but they're going to be living on the backs of those who are producing something. Because the government mandated a system that really hasn't been flushed out all that well. And I would hope that we would stop and pause for a minute and, and try to find ways to incentivize people. I had a bill in 2006, an Energy Star system for servers, computer servers, because the largest growing energy use in the United States at that time were server farms. And lo and behold, built on an incentive system, it has radically changed the way. Now they advertise on those servers which are the most efficient servers. And it changed the way. If you talk to the people in the industry, they say it absolutely changed the way we buy, produce, sell servers. Fantastic. We didn't mandate anything. And, I, and it, it concerns me for a couple of reasons. And I wanted to talk to the Secretary for a minute. I, I come from Michigan. Nobody's hurt more in this economy than we are. Uh, and to say that this administration has done more for the car companies than anyone else is a bit shocking to us who live there. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, they went in, and the guy who, who cut the workforce by, uh, from General Motors in half got concessions from the union, produced the car of the year last year, the, the CTS Cadillac. Oh, by the way, produced the car of the year, the Malibu, both of which are built in my district, by the way, this year. He, the government came in and said, you got to go. You're fired. Oh, and take the board with you, and you have 30 days for a viability plan. That's pretty hard to recover from when you're going through all of those tough times. And oh, by the way, they have more cars that get over 30 miles to the gallon than any other car company, period, in the world. The government didn't do that. They did that. The Chevy Volt, which uh, Mr. Dingle so aptly uh, talk, talked about, will revolutionize the way we think about commuting and how we power our cars. It's the first time it's an electric-driven engine that is that is charged by gasoline versus the other way around, which really radically departs even from hybrid technology. Very exciting. Billions and billions of dollars of research, decades, they were ahead of the curve. And what do we do? We come to this committee and kick them around. They finally got the attention of the American people. Really? In 2007, they mandated $80 billion in costs on these car companies. Gasoline went to 450, and they're struggling to make it and we are losing jobs as fast uh, as we can count them. So uh, when you, be careful when you tell us that. The proposal for cap and tax will raise the energy rates for producing everything in the United States of America. Secretary Chu, you mentioned that, gee, if we raise the rates of gasoline, it's going to hurt average Americans. Absolutely right. If we dramatically raise the rates of electricity, we will not be competitive when it comes to building anything in the United States. It is an attack on the middle class. It's an absolute slap in the face to everybody that got up and built good cars, or they built houses, or they got in their car and drove somewhere to build something of use in the United States. 
And guess what India said this week? They're not going to play along. Go ahead, United States, make yourself uncompetitive, because we've got lots of mouths to feed, and we would love to be the new center of the middle class in the next several hundred years. I, I'm, I'm just shocked that you would say that about a company who has done so much to survive and will lead the way in 2011 when that Chevy Volt rolls off the line. You know, in this, also in the new proposal, there's an inventory tax increase. And if you produce anything in a just-in-time manufacturing system, you are getting hurt by this inventory tax increase. So manufacturers are going to take it on both ends of this. And that is very frustrating to those of us who represent lots of people who believe that the middle class is important. And you know, I'm, you know, I had questions, but I, uh, the fact that you uh, uh, stand before us and tell us that you are, have done more for the automobile companies than other administration, as you can tell, put a burr under my saddle. But we certainly don't think so. And we would hope that you would look at every job lost. You talk about green jobs created, you forgot to tell us how many manufacturing jobs go overseas. And we know there's a bunch of them. So, I, Mr. Chairman, I would argue we better go slow and we better worry about the middle class in this country that is quickly evaporating because of all of the weight and burden we're putting on their ability to produce anything in the United States. The gentleman's time has expired, but Secretary LaHood, if you would like to make a comment, uh, we would allow you to do this. Thank you. Uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm from Washington. I just want to tell you I've got some constituents who are so happy you three are here today. They've been waiting for you to get to Washington, D.C. The obvious one is Dennis Hayes, one of the two co-founders of Earth Day. But the non-obvious ones are the people at uh, the Sapphire Energy Company, which are developing algae-based biofuels, which have zero net uh, CO2 emissions. The people at Infinia in Washington that have developed a sterling engine-based solar power system. The people at Alter Rock in North Seattle, which are developing one of the world's leading engineered geothermal uh, systems. The people at McKinstry, that's the world leading energy efficiency contractor, really, probably in the world. Uh, the better place people that are developing uh, an electrical infrastructure for electric cars. The Ramgen Company in Bellevue, Washington, which has developed a, a way to sequester CO2 so we maybe can use coal cleanly and create hundreds of jobs in this country. These people are thrilled that you are here to promote these job creation uh, uh, exercises. Now, now, we have heard many occasions people have said that President Obama said that this was going to be bad for the economy at this some time. I've heard him say repeatedly that, in fact, this bill is going to grow jobs and ultimately good, be good for the economy. I think this bill has been quite well balanced because it speaks to multiple technologies and multiple ways to create jobs. It hasn't just picked favorites. Is that a fair assessment of this? I'll just ask Dr. Chu that. Yes, I, it, is a, it, I, it is a fair assessment. I think um, uh, I would just also want to uh, emphasize that uh, it is looking towards the future, uh, you know, to use a sports analogy, um, when Wayne Gretzky was asked how come he was such an immortal uh, hockey player, he said, because I skated to where the puck will be. And I think this bill actually brings that, to, that w it positions America to go to, to the future and, and for the jobs of the future. I want to ask you about the low carbon fuel standard. Uh, I think an important portion of this bill that will promote the development of low carbon emitting uh, fuels. Um, we've tried to address this so that it is consistent with the other parts of the bill, our other regulatory systems. For instance, it does not kick in effectively till the renewable fuel standard essentially expires. So it's, we, we've tried to tailor it in a careful fashion. Uh, it also um, really draws on the European experience that a cap and trade bill, while very important, is not the only game in town. And I think their experience is you have to take multiple approaches to this, to this big challenge, not just a cap and trade system. Just wonder if you have any comments, either uh, Dr. Chu or, or uh, uh, Secretary Jackson, in that regard. I, I absolutely agree that uh, the design of the discussion draft is such that it phases the low carbon fuel standard in after the renewable fuel standards that are authorized, also by a different, you know, a, a law of Congress, uh, are done. And I uh, could not agree more that uh, experience has shown that. The cap-and-trade program, while an extremely powerful tool to 
harness the kind of private capital that you just referenced in your opening remarks. And I, you know, certainly that is the key. The key is to make those who are investing in that green, en green energy uh, future um, able to do it in a way that they know with certainty that this country is turning its gaze towards that. It makes the private sector full partners in the game, and I think it's uh, part of why uh, U.S. CAP, it's not just the big companies of U.S. CAP who have done extraordinary thinking on this in partnership with uh, NGOs, but also the smaller folks. Thank you. I'll, I'll take that as an answer. We do want to ask one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, the longer I look at this, it becomes apparent that our ability to really maximize these clean resources of solar and wind and hydrokinetic and the like depends on the development of a grid system fit for this century which we do not have today. I think one of the great quotes I've heard is that the bad news is that Thomas Edison would recognize our grid system. Uh, this is not really a, a salutary remark. Uh, one of the things I hope we can work on in the development of this bill is a way to increase the ability to site uh, increased transmission systems so that we can access the solar in the southwest and the wind in the midwest and the offshore wind and the hydrokinetic to move it where we need it. We have some proposals to try to have backstop authority for the federal government to assist the siting of transmission in the event that we can't do it through sort of the, the typical channels. Uh, would you encourage us in that regard? Would you, if any comments you have, I'd appreciate it. Dr. Chu, perhaps you want to Yes, um, I, I, I would encourage you to try to develop this. I think uh, you are quite right as we go forward and develop renewable energy uh, that we have to concurrently uh, develop a a new transmission system uh, that, that can handle that. It, uh, the fact that uh, wind and solar are uh, variable means that you have to have a much more robust system that's able to port energy very rapidly from different parts of the country. So, so um, uh, increased siting authority is one element. It, it can't be the only element, but, but because uh, after all, you know, just with increased siting authority alone, I think there has to be other elements that would help encourage uh, the, local, the states and local areas to, to allow that. But it's a very important part of, of our way into the future. And we hope you'll continue to encourage us all. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Minsley. Um, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you all for your patience this morning. Um, Ms. Jackson, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about your pronouncement of regulating CO2 under the Clean Air Act and that you could do that or the agency could do that with or without uh, Congress and our consent. And I'd like to know what your timetable is. Uh, how do you see the agency moving forward on, on that regulation? I'd, I'd certainly like to just clarify that it's not without, uh, with or without Congress's consent. It's actually the Clean Air Act, the law passed by Congress and signed by the President, that compels us to end the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Clean Air Act that compelled EPA to make a finding, and it is a proposed finding. As far as timetable, that timetable starts with the proposal and a 60-day public comment. If it is a finalized, and presuming it is finalized, regulatory action uh, would proceed after that. The history of the Clean Air Act, which is a good guide, is that proposed regulations under that act take months to propose, and, you know, after that the process goes. Okay. Let me ask you this then. With whatever uh, emission standard that you use in that, as you go through that period, will sectors of the economy, such as Mr. Terry was talking about farming, and we all have great concerns about farming. Right now, building construction, we have tremendous concerns about that. Are they going to be forced to meet that standard? What, what do you see coming at us through that? If, if there is regulation under the Clean Air Act in the future, if that happens, EPA would move, as it does on uh, other regulations, to look at the largest sources first. And in our economy, the largest sources of greenhouse gases are mobile sources, automobiles and trucks, and then the large stationary sources, the, especially the power generation sector. So I think we could expect that if there were regulations, that would be where EPA's first regulatory actions would be. And again, I don't believe we would ever get to the small sources. I think 
those discussions are really being made to scare people with an un, an, a very unlikely future instead of focusing on the big issue, which is cars and power generation. So you see it affecting cars. Do you, would you apply that also to the Sibyl? In addition to your uh, actions under the Clean Air or your proposed actions under the Clean Air Act, would you look at the bill and uh, say the same thing that you you would focus more on uh, the large items such as transportation rather than farming and uh, home construction? Right. Well, the the. Uh, as the drafter pointed out, as the chairman pointed out, we are actually, the bill says that uh, regulations would be for those large sources, over 25,000. Okay, so. let me come to Mr. LaHood then. Uh, and Mr. Secretary, I'd like to just ask you, when you look at the low carbon fuel standard in the bill, what do you see that doing to prices at the pump? If the focus is going to be on the large sectors like transportation fuels, what do you see that doing to the price at the pump? Uh, well, I, I wouldn't have any idea. I don't know if Dr. Chu would or not. I just, uh, I simply don't know the answer to that. Okay, Dr. Chu, any comment? Uh, it will increase the price of the pump, but the other issue is that also in this bill, what, what we are focusing on is trying to uh, hold transportation costs the same. And so this is also, we're encouraging higher mileage vehicles, uh, things of that nature. And, and uh, depending on, uh, on how this committee, uh, working with the administration, works the allocations, uh, the impact on the American people for the, the total cost of living, we hope to be as moderate as possible. So, in other words, you all see this as increasing the cost to the American consumer, the price at the pump and the, the price of electric power generation? We see this as shifting costs so that so that uh, what happens is as, as we um, return the allocations back to the American public and to the um, energy sectors that would be most ad adversely affected, that uh, the overall cost of living, if you will, which is the essential thing, uh, plus the fact that we're aggressively moving towards uh, higher efficiency, higher efficiency cars, higher efficiency uh, homes, that those costs actually can be held uh, constant. Okay. Mr. Chu, let me ask you this about the uh, renewable energy, the 20,000 megawatts of renewable energy that would need to come online every year in order to meet the 2025 deadline at the 25 percent uh, renewable energy standard. Do you think that that is a realistic goal? Uh, yes, it is. And then how did you come to that conclusion? Well, actually, um, uh, in the following way, I actually asked the EIA uh, for an analysis several weeks ago. And what, what, the, what we did is we took uh, a baseline of where we saw the baseline going, then we added to it the stimulus, uh, the Economic Recovery Act, which actually accelerates the deployment of uh, re uh, renewable energy. You also, uh, in the provision of the bill, there are small power producers uh, for example, a university that has a cogen plant, a, mm -hmm. a small town. You take those off. You don't want uh, this university to have a renewable portfolio. You take that off the mix from the 25 percent. It, it decreases the target by about 3 percent. Uh, depending on whether efficiency is going to be worked into this bill uh, to take another 5 percent off, you're now talking about uh, a difference of doing nothing and, and the 25 percent target mm -hmm. as something on the scale of 5 or 6 percent additional beyond what the country, that what the EIA projects the country doing. So it's actually a, a quite a reasonable bill in my opinion. Okay. General Lee's time has expired. Mr. Matheson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I welcome the panel here. And uh, Secretary Chu, maybe following up on your discussion with Mr. Inslee, I know when I had a chance to see you a few weeks ago, we had a brief discussion about the electric transmission issue about the need for uh, finding ways to encourage greater investment and greater <laughs> beefing up of that infrastructure. You'd mentioned you'd been having discussions, I think, with EIA and others about this. Um, this draft probably needs to be beefed up on its transmission section. Do you have thoughts about how we should be looking at that issue and things that we should incorporate in this draft bill in terms of encouraging investment in our transmission grid? Well, I think I'm, I'm looking forward to actually working with the committee on this. Um, it, it, let me also say that uh, 
not only the Department of Energy, but FERC, uh, mm -hmm. Department of Interior, Agriculture, uh, CEQ have been meeting regularly. We have now regularly scheduled meetings in trying to formulate what should we should be doing in terms of transmission and distribution. And so it is very much on our mind because, as I said before, this is a very necessary part yeah. of moving the country forward. Uh, we have um, a somewhat old-fashioned energy and distribution um, system. Uh, it's been carpent, carpent divided into you know, vertically uh, organized utility companies, RTOs, ISOs, all this. this. And, and in the past, what happened is that these various sectors look out and they, they try to make the best judgments they can uh, within their realm of responsibility. And what that has led to is, is we don't have something that serves the nation in its best possible way, that we have incredible renewable energy resources, but they're distributed geographically across the country. So, so I think you know, anything that can help the siting, anything that can help uh, get the states and the local communities to say, yes, this is a necessary part of the development of the United States is, is, would be very appreciated. I think there's broad consensus that we need to look at transmission policy in this Congress, and uh, I'm pleased to hear you're meeting with these other agencies. I think any input that you could offer us for legislative action to help move that forward, I think, would be appreciated by, by all of us. Um, next question I would ask you, Secretary Chu, if I could. Um, one of the struggles, I think, um, that I'm having right now with putting this whole bill together is, is that, we, you know, we've had hearings on specific issues for two and a half years, and now we're trying to look how it all looks as one package. And the concept of cap and trade is that there's going to be a market-based set of incentives to meet, meet the cap. And that's the driver, to let the marketplace figure out the most efficient ways to go about doing this. And yet there are a number of other sections of the bill where Congress goes in and specifically says, okay, on this technology we want to encourage it in this way, and for that technology, that issue, we want to encourage it that way. And it's hard to find the right mix for how much Congress should get into those individual areas and not. For example, carbon capture and sequestration, I think it's appropriate that we got to encourage that with the, the carbon capture sequestration of this bill. But have you thought about the context of this bill where we have a renewable portfolio standard, we have the energy efficiency standard, we have, we have a lot of different um, components of the bill that are trying to achieve lower carbon emissions, but it's under this broad category of cap and trade. And should we, you know, are, do you have concern about it? is Congress overly prescribing what we should do as opposed to the cap and trade mechanism that allows the marketplace to make those decisions? Well, uh, I think I will agree with you. Overall, the cap and trade allows, it, it actually incentivizes um, the United States industry to look for uh, lower carbon solutions. However, uh, you know, it's not going to start until 2012. It, it's going to have to ramp up. We need to give uh, industry and the consumers time to adjust. And so if, so I view, for example, the renewable electricity standard as a different tool that is also necessary because a renewable electricity standard then creates a marketplace, a guaranteed marketplace for things like wind, solar, new geothermal, uh, run of the river hydro, things of that nature. And that guarantees a marketplace. So if I were an investor and said, what, well, do I want to invest tens to hundreds of millions of dollars? Uh, well, I have a market for that. Do you think lo no carbon emission coal production should be included in that mix then, in terms of I think, encouraging investors? I think the overall goal should be to encourage all forms of uh, no or very low carbon emissions. Uh, um, but I'd be glad to be working with the committee on, on these issues. But, but just, just say that the renewable electricity standard is a different mechanism that's somewhat orthogonal to uh, cap and trade. It, it, it's to create a market, to create a draw that will guarantee the investors of, uh, that they can actually have a customer. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What, what was that word? Orthogonal? <laughs> Pardon? You said a word that I didn't understand. It, 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 Oh, orthogonal. That means, um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> perpendicular. It means, it means uh, the carbon cap and trade is a, a way of overall globally putting uh, the real costs of, of energy in, into the marketplace and, and letting the market then uh, seek uh, solutions. It's, it's overall what we need. But in addition to that, uh, something that, that 
more quickly stimulates investment in new technologies, is, I think, is also needed. So in that case, it's, it, it's, it's not exactly the same thing in a different way. It, it, it satisfies a different need. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Scalise. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Administrator Jackson, uh, in your opening statements, you talked about uh, the jobs that would be created, uh, green jobs that would be created under a cap-and-trade bill. Can you quantify how many jobs you estimate would be created under this legislation? No, I, I believe what I said, sir, is that this is the jobs bill and that the bill right. in, the discussion draft bill in its entirety uh, is, is aimed to jumpstart our move into the green economy. And I think you quoted President Obama saying that it was his opinion that he would that this bill would create millions of jobs. I think you used the term millions. Is there anything that you can base your determination on how many jobs will be created? I, EPA has not done a, a model or any kind of uh, modeling on jobs creation numbers. Okay, because you did do in the analysis, and I looked through, there are definitely a number of questions I have with the assumptions that are made in your analysis. I wasn't sure. Since you used the term a jobs bill in your opening statement, I just wanted to know if you had anything to quantify or back that up. Uh, well, I, I back it up on uh, some somewhat common sense, which is that if we're trying to move to a green energy economy and we heard Secretary Chu talk about the fact that the innovations that we come up with in this country are being used by other countries and manufacturing is moving there, that, that the rhetorical question is what is the plan to keep them here and how do we convince the private sector that we mean it, that we're going to be using the technologies that we right. have. And, and in spite of and, and this isn't something that you said. Some people in the administration have claimed that there is no alternative plan. Uh, that's not an accurate statement because clearly uh, there is an alternative plan that was presented last year on comprehensive energy. Uh, there is one that's being uh, worked on this year on an alternative plan to cap and trade that would create jobs, pursue alternative sources of energy, but also make sure we don't lose the jobs we have. And I think that's been a big concern raised by many groups uh, predicting the number of jobs. And when the term millions thrown around, uh, many industry groups have used the term that millions of jobs would be lost, exported out of the U.S. economy into countries like India and China. Do you have any estimates on how many jobs will be lost by cap and trade? Well, I, all I know is I, I'm not a jobs expert. All I know is that jobs have been lost and our economy is hurting. And this is a plan to address that by, by moving a manufacturing sector here that uh, the world will need and that our country will need. That, right. that's and, and, you know, while you might not be a jobs expert, you, you're obviously talking about, you know, and touting this bill as a jobs bill. If you would claim that it would create jobs, uh, are you making an assumption that it won't lose any jobs, that no jobs will be lost? Or if, if you don't make that claim, how many jobs would you expect to be lost? Because groups have made very large claims. I mean, National Association of Manufacturers claims our country would lose three to four million jobs as a result of a cap-and-trade energy tax. So I just wanted to know if you I, I, or any other members of the panel want to answer that question. I'll go first, and I'll turn it Secretary over to Chu, if you would. But I, I, I know that lobbyists claim large uh, doomsday scenarios, quiet deaths for businesses across the country. That's what lobbyists said about the Clean Air Act in 1990, and it, it didn't happen. In fact, the U.S. economy grew 64%. Uh, so you while, don't think while this country cut acid rain emissions by more so than... So you don't think that there will be job losses then? You're, so you're saying those doomsday scenarios I, by those groups? I believe one of the tasks in moving forward as this committee discusses is to, is to figure out how the cap and trade process and the other aspects of the bill can be used to jumpstart and move us forward. Right. In the well, and there are a lot of those rate. details that aren't in the language, and that's been one of the, the, ex the expressions that's been made by many members of this committee, is that a lot of those details still are not written in this bill. The, the allowances, uh, a big portion of the bill, how this, this trading program would even work, uh, isn't in the bill. Uh, since it's silent on allowances, does the administration have a position on allowances and how many allowances should be given uh, for free to, to industry groups, to, to consumers? Uh, do you all have a position on how allowances should be given away? Uh, because that's an unanswered question in this bill. Do you have a, a position? Does your department have a position? The, the president has uh, said that he believes that there should be a 100 percent auction of allowances. That should that said, be, re as should that that be said, re rebated to consumers? Should, you know, because one of the concerns is how much, and many uh, predictions are out there, backed up by a lot of ev evidence on how much 
money taxpayers, American families, would pay. Peter Orzog, President's Own Budget Director, last year gave testimony that a 15 percent reduction in carbon emissions would lead to a $1,300 a year increase in utility bills for every American family, on top of the fact that they'd be paying higher for gas prices, which many of you have already acknowledged, uh, as well as other energy-related items. Uh, so that some members of the administration have actually put some quantified numbers there. Uh, so on, on the rebate side, would you be willing to rebate any amount that a consumer would have to pay in higher utility rates back to them based on the allowances? The, the President has also called for allowance value to be returned to those. Uh, and, and, and I'm running out of time, so just yes or no. The gentleman yes no. has expired, so we'll give it the witness a chance to answer the question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the, the, the administration looks forward to working on those questions, and the President, though he's called for a 100 percent auction, is interested in working with this committee on ways to mitigate impacts on the economy and believes that that the bones of that are in this discussion draft, and there's there's flesh to be put on those bones, but that that challenge could be addressed. Thank, what other, you. Thank uh, you, Mr. Scalise and Ms. Christensen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, three questions, I think. Um, Administrator Jackson, uh, you've been asked several times about the recently proposed um, finding that greenhouse gases and then endanger public health, and which lists in particular six gases. As you know, the Congressional Black Caucus and the Health Brain Trust, which I chair, also have as priorities the same population groups that you identify as being most vulnerable. And I realize you're still in the comment period, and you've been asked a couple of questions about this, but are you satisfied that this bill could do what's necessary to address this finding? And if not, is there anything that could or would be added to um, this comprehensive bill, which, among other things, reduces harmful uh, emissions to um, address this. For example, um, I think we list five greenhouse gases. We don't list the perfluorocarbons, and I'm a little rusty on my organic chemistry. But m should we add that to the list? I, I do believe we need to address uh, fluorocarbons, and um, and I do believe that there's uh, in easy ways to do that. I know that one of the things being considered is a Montreal Protocol-like address. To answer your larger question, um, yes, I believe this bill does a much better job than what EPA could do now under the authorities it has. This is a better solution. There are other solutions. The Clean Air Act offers some uh, direction, but it is incomplete at best. And so I believe this bill is a much better way of addressing the the endangerment finding, the proposal that uh, we released last week. Thank you. Secretary LaHood, uh, your department lists in your testimony um, several very active programs that um, reduce greenhouse, gas, greenhouse gases and advocate cleaner energy in many areas. And I particularly appreciate the livable communities effort because as we try to address health, we look at the larger picture and the social determinants. And I think that you know, this gets to that. And don't forget we talked about adding the Secretary of Health and Human Services at, with HUD, the HUD Secretary in this effort. But do any of the, the projects that you're, you've referenced specifically reach out to blighted, distressed communities, poor communities, minority communities that need this help the most? Absolutely, and that's the reason that we're working with the HUD Secretary. And I might mention we're working, I'm working with my two colleagues that are with me uh, here today on on the whole livable communities issue. But uh, uh, Sean Donovan, Secretary Donovan and I have had numerous discussions about this, how we can really share the resources from both departments uh, in looking at communities, uh, uh, not only in terms of housing and, uh, and different types of housing, but uh, the transportation needs that need to be met for, so people can go to work and, and go to their doctor's appointments. and. Uh, and we're going to include rural areas in this too, because it, it, the rural areas uh, have as great a need as any any part of our country. And so, it, there will be a real collaboration within the administration to make the whole livable community uh, include uh, housing not only in the urban area but in the rural areas, and incorporate uh, some of the activities that are going on in these departments too. Thank you, Dr. Chu. Um it seems as though the nuclear energy questions have kind of let up for a while. But um, just so I'm clear, and it follows up on um, Congressman Rush's question, 
where the bill refers to low carbon energy producers, doesn't that automatically include nuclear energy producers? Uh, I oh. agree with you that nuclear energy is a, is a low, low en near so zero carbon energy source. So we talk about source. supporting and promoting low energy carbon producers, we're, we're, we're in essence including nuclear energy. Yes, uh, I mean, as I pointed out before, there are other bills. Uh, whether it's incorporated in this bill is, is something that uh, the administration will be working with this sure. committee on, but, but certainly the support of the nuclear and restarting the nuclear industry has been supported in other bills, including the Economic Recovery Act. Right, and I think you've been very clear about the administration's position. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, the Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do appreciate the, the panel here. It's good to see my friend Ray LaHood, um, who is a mentor and a friend, and I'm, we're really excited about your position. Dr. Chu, I look forward to meeting with you personally and having another uh, chance in this committee to talk about the numerous things that are going on with the Department of Energy. Uh, uh, I, I, I know your background. I've been following. Uh, uh, your ex your experience, and I, I just I really do look forward to spending some time with you. I hope we can get that arranged. Uh, let me start out. For those of who have been following this debate for many many years, there's uh, there's no uh, hiding where I'm at. I, I, you know, I I base this as the largest assault on democracy and freedom in this country that I've ever experienced. I've lived through some tough times in Congress, impeachment two wars, terrorist attacks. I fear this more than all the above activities that have happened. And I'll, and I'll tell you why as, as I go through. But I have some questions. Uh, um, uh, Secretary LaHood, has China agreed to a low carbon fuel standard, yes or no? I don't know. Uh, I think it's no. Uh, how about India? Have they agreed to some type of low carbon fuel standard? Uh, I don't know. Um, okay. I, I would think that would be important in this debate if we're going to be world competitive. Dr. Chu, has China agreed to an international regime to cap carbon dioxide? Not yet. Not yet. H how about India? Has India agreed to an uh, international regi regime to cap carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases? Nope. No, they have not. Uh, Administrator Jackson, what is the largest emitter of methane? gas? I believe we determined earlier, sir, that it is probably livestock. And I don't think that is correct. I no. think that the largest emitter of methane gas is wetlands. So if wetlands is the largest emitter of methane gas, you're not proposing that we drain wetlands, are you? Sir, uh, we're, we're talking about anthropogenic causes of global warming. Wetlands are a natural feature. So the answer so is no, you're not proposing draining. Wetlands. So the answer is no, you're not proposing draining wetlands. Uh, no, we are not okay. proposing draining wetlands. Great, thank you. The, uh, let me uh, take a uh, follow-up on Congressman Green's line of questioning. The problem that we have on the uh, analysis of what uh, Administrator Jackson, you proposed to us, it's not your fault. It's the fault of this draft, which has no, that's a big gaping hole. And that is, what is the cost of the credits? What are the allocations? And my, my fear, or my belief, is that this is an intentional move to deceive us so that we're not allowed to do the cost-benefit analysis. Now, we know the cost-benefit analysis of the Lieberman Warner Bill and because the allocations were addressed. And those numbers have that the cost of um, energy cost go from natural gas is an increase from 26 to 36 percent by 2020 and 108 percent to 146 by 2030. Now, this is a bill that is less stringent than this proposal. The electricity cost in 2020 under the Lieberman Warner bill was 28 to 33 percent increase and uh, in 2030 101 percent to 129 percent. Do you dispute that analysis of the Lieberman Warner bill? Anyone? I, I believe that analysis was done between EPA and DOE and that is part of the analysis. The analysis of this discussion draft does not show skyrocketing. Yeah, because we don't have all the data. We don't, have, we don't have the credits. 
it is the height of hypocrisy for this administration and this leadership to bring a bill to a hearing when we don't have the data to ask the great questions about the cost. And here's why. We talk about the Clean Air Act amendments and no jobs lost. Well, I'll tell you, my committee, these folks have seen these. This is Kincaid Peabody number 10, Kincaid, Illinois. Clean Air Act 1990, you know how many miners lost their jobs? And I have the Illinois DNR stats. 1,200 mine workers lost their jobs. The state of Ohio, we got colleagues on this committee. Uh, you know how many jobs were lost in Ohio under the Clean Air Act amendments? Uh, let me ask, this, uh, since Administrator Jackson, you know how many jobs? Coal miner jobs were lost in Ohio because of the Clean Air Act amendments, uh, which, which you were addressing earlier. No, sir. 35,000. So those of us who want jobs, and those of us who want jobs, are going to try to defeat this bill. And we're going to hold our colleagues on the other side accountable, especially if, if they're from areas that depend on the fossil fuel economy. And I yield. Gentlemen's time has expired. We'll now hear, hear from uh, uh, Ms. Castor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to our panel for your leadership and your testimony today. Um, the American people are hungry for a new direction and a, a modern energy policy. I think the American people are so far beyond the, um, a lot of the partisan discussions in Washington. This really isn't a, a partisan debate. No, that's not what I, what I hear back home. Uh, first of all, I want to I thank you for your efforts on the recovery plan because uh, it shouldn't be lost on us that the, a historic foundation for a new direction in energy policy has already been laid under the recovery plan, and it's marrying uh, job creation with an, our new energy future, the weatherization programs to save people uh, monies on, on their electric bill, greater energy efficiency, the transmission grid. These are vital investments for, for the future of this country. Uh, but we've got a whole lot more to do, and this discussion draft is a good, is a good starting point. Uh, but it, as you can tell, it's not going to be it's not going to be easy. Uh, Dr. Chu, a couple of months ago, the state of Florida uh, uh, adopted or her, received a final report on Florida's renewable energy potential assessment uh, received by the Florida governor's office. Uh, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab was uh, involved as well. It states uh, that solar technology has the largest renewable energy uh, potential in the state of Florida. I guess this isn't any, any surprise for the Sunshine State. But right now, we, we produce maybe 2 percent of our energy in Florida from renewable sources, and the leading uh, producer isn't even solar energy, it's, it's biomass. Uh, it's been interesting because even with uh, just the discussions at the federal level and the state level, our electric utilities have started to invest in solar technology. Uh, the FPL is making a significant investment in South Florida in solar technologies. So I think this lends credence to your marketplace ideas and how important it's going to be. Did, will you go into greater detail on what we can do to make to make solar technologies more affordable? And is it going to be on the on the large scale? Uh, are we doing enough in the discussion draft? Could you highlight certain concepts in the discussion draft? And what role do uh, homeowners have to play as they, because there's a hunger out there to install uh, solar panels if, if they were affordable and it made sense? Well, I think the first thing is uh, the, the wonderful thing about solar uh, energy is, and I would agree with you and, and that report, is it, it has an enormous potential in the long run. I, if you consider how much sunlight energy is hitting the Earth, uh, I did a quick calculation a couple of years ago which suggested that um, a few percent, less than 5 percent of the world's deserts, uh, if you can harness solar energy, 20 percent of, of the energy hitting that and distribute it and store it, that would satisfy the world's current electricity needs, just 5 percent of the world's deserts. So, so the first thing I think one can do is 
there's lots of programs statewide uh, and also federal government encouraging solar, but one of the things is that solar energy is generated at a time when you need the most amount of energy during hot summer days when the air conditioning is, is uh, taxing the ability to generate electricity. So I would advocate to encourage all states to evolve into what we call real-time pricing. That um, if you ask on those hot summer days where people are running their air conditioning, how much does the real cost of energy, what's the real cost of energy? Well, it's, it's quite high because the utility companies have to have installed backup generation systems for those one or two percent of the days where in order to avoid a brownout, you have to have them running. But a lot of the time, most of the time, they're sitting idle. So that's invested capital sitting idle. So if you do real-time pricing so that on those uh, hot summer days, the real price of electricity for the utility company, for the generators, is quite high. It's, it's, but alternatively, at nighttime, it's quite low. And so that will encourage uh, both businesses and homeowners to start to, if they can put off the use of energy in, at night, uh, and use it and during the day, that means we have to build less new power plants. Uh, the return on a particular investment will be much higher, which will drive the energy costs down for it, the businesses and for consumers. Real-time pricing will allow solar energy to give a big boost because it, it, is, it is producing that energy where, when it's the most expensive. And so that's, that's one thing. The other thing is, quite frankly, you know, we should be taking a leadership in inventing new solar technologies. We've, our first loan that the Department of Energy approved was to a company that's going to next generation thin film solar technology. Uh, the company estimates that thousands of new jobs will be created, but mostly we're also trying, the jobs are incredibly important, and we're also trying to develop the technology so so the United States resumes its leadership position in new solar technologies. They can drive the cost down considerably. And that's the other important part of this. Thank you, Ms. Castor. Uh, now the uh, chair recognizes uh, Mr. Radonovich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to uh, welcome uh, the secretaries and administrator to the uh, committee. Uh, Mr. LaHood, it's great to see you back on the, in the Congress. Um, I, I, I represent the San Joaquin Valley in California. A lot of farming happens there, and I, I'm, you know, there's a, there's a lot more my constituents are worrying about than, than global warming right now. We've got a, an imposition from the Endangered Species Act that shut down the pumps in the Delta, and uh, a lot of my farmers are getting z a zero allocation this year. It's costing 40 to 60,000 jobs, and it's, um, going to result in about a $9 billion loss in the state's industry. And I honestly think that my state is suffering more from environmental alarmism than it is uh, global warming. And uh, uh, added to that, this concept of uh, cap and trade, to me, just seems to make the problem worse. Um, Secretary Chu, welcome. I noticed that that there was a, you, you paid a visit to California recently, I think it was, you were quoted in the LA Times saying that uh, because of global warming, agriculture in California was going to be gone in about 30 years. And um, one, one other quote, and, and, and I just want to have a dialogue on, on this, was a quote that somehow we have to figure out how to boost the price of gasoline to levels in Europe, which at the time was eight, $8 a gallon. My concern for my constituents is that if you adopt something like a cap and trade system, how do you, I don't see how you can, I, the math doesn't work. You add uh, a, a price of gas onto the fact that we have a man-made drought in California taking the water away. You increase the per price of the gallon of gas or diesel f from five bucks, six back up to six bucks a gallon the way it was last year. Um, you're going to see the state's largest industry, $90 billion, of the main supplier of, um, of fruits and vegetables to the nation, farm out. And if you don't like the fact that 70% of your energy uh, comes from foreign countries, how would you like to have 70% of your food supply leave the country? Because that's what's happening in my neck of the woods. I, for the life of me, can't figure out how you think that you can do something like this 
without dramatically increasing the debt, national debt, and deficit by subsidizing a false economy and by raising the price to consumers on energy. I think when the public finds out the true cost of this thing, you're going to see a smackdown that the World Wrestling Federation would be proud to see by the public toward this plan, which is unreasonable. I think research, developing efficiencies in energy and uh, smoothing this transition to another source of fuel, I think is a great idea. But this cap and trade notion, once the public finds out that their prices in the home and, and at the fuel uh, pump, is uh, they're not going to buy this. This will stop. This will not go anywhere when you see the true co cost of this thing come down. In the energy portfolio of the United States, 70% of it consists of fossil fuels, 20% is nuclear, 10% is renewable, and of that renewable portion, 10% is, um, is um, um, hydro, hydroelectricity, that's about 3%. So you're proposing to take 7% of our energy portfolio and make it how much, how long, and how I guess my question to anybody who's going to answer this is, what do you think is going to be the, the cost to the household? Because I've, I see numbers of $3,000 or over $3,000 to the cost of this plan to the household. And then, then we've talked about the high price of gas, Secretary Shu, eight bucks or whatever. I mean, you know, it, it, it's an increase on the energy supply to the United States. How on earth do you think you can pull this off without breaking the back of the government and of the consumer? I'll go first and I'll turn it over to the Secretary. EPA's modeling shows not, not at all those, those cost ranges, sir. It shows 98 to 140 dollars for the average household per year, not 3,000. That is a misstatement of an MIT study uh, that actually shows something in your In your opinion. I mean, well, in your opinion. opinion. I mean, I'm not sure I trust you for the facts as much as I would trust that, that study. How can I know? But I mean, that, how do I know your modeling is correct? And what are your assumptions? What are you basing? You mentioned 40 percent goes back of the cap and trade revenues to the household. How does how does that work? How does that happen? The history of EPA's modeling shows that we are usually conservative, that we usually overestimate the cost, not underestimate. How does that 40 percent get back to the consumer that Gen you're talking Gentleman's about? time has expired. If uh, Let the witness, well, the witness will have a chance to answer briefly. If, if you could me. answer, um, the, the, how does that 40 percent get back? The 40 percent was modeled as a rebate back to American consumers, to American households. That's what we were In asking. A check model. in the mail? Uh, it gets back to the, I, I don't know that we, mo the Could model you let me know how that gets back to the consumer, please? Uh, well, I, sir, I, I, it's not my decision to make. We well, were then maybe the you'd re better remodel so you can explain to people how that's going to get back in their pockets. Mr. Will the gentleman thank yield to Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Will the gentleman yield to Yes. I just well, I don't have any time left, but I'm happy to. Uh, the, the statement about California agriculture being gone. That wasn't because of the bill. That was because of, of global warming. Is An that interpretation yeah. of the results of global warming 40 years from now. Uh, you know, actually, uh, barely put. That if, if that was the quote, it was inaccurate because I, 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 I know about this. Uh, I was citing uh, some studies, uh, two studies, in fact, uh, of predictions of what, what will happen if we continued on a business as usual model. Um, and those studies said, and they took two scenarios. An optimistic scenario, you keep the carbon below 500 parts per million. It's a, it's a target that we're all trying to work towards. And in that study, in the first part of this century, uh, by 2050, uh, the snowpack in California will be reduced in the optimistic scenario by 26 percent. We all have 74 percent of the snowpack that we had in today. And in the more pessimistic scenario, business as usual scenario, it would be down to 60 percent. By the end of this century, the 21st century, uh, it's considerably less, uh, it, as much as 93 percent decrease in the snowpack of California if we continued as business as usual in the, and so it was that concern for the agriculture of California that I was speaking of. And, and I respect that if I can respond, Mr. Chairman. Environmental alarmism in the form of uh, uh, Endangered Species Act that is a runaway locomotive and the cost of this cap-and-trade system will kill agriculture long before 
global warming does. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, I have a yes, letter please. here from uh, John M. Riley uh, correcting the statement that they made, uh, and it's a letter to the Republican leader, uh, which uh, has a much lower cost per family. And I, if it's possible to have this put in the record, if not, I'll distribute it to the committee. Oh. But it, it is a corrective letter, which uh, states correctly the, the the right information. Without objection, Mr. Je uh, with right object, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, would uh, just so if 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 my if my former colleague can do that, I'd like the article from the Weekly Standard that debunks uh, those numbers also included into record. Without objection, we'll take both documents and put them in the record. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Uh, Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your testimony. It's, um, it's been very, very insightful. Uh, you know, I, I think that at the beginning, you all laid out the challenge that we face. Uh, we talked about the potential for jobs under this bill, and, and uh, Administrator Jackson, your desire to jumpstart us towards that new green economy. And Secretary Chu, uh, you, you also um, agreed that there's great potential. But you really put your finger on the, on the point when you said that the question is, how do we transition from here to there? Okay. And, uh, and, and that's extraordinarily important to the people that I represent in Ohio. And I think it's extraordinarily important to people far beyond Ohio. Uh, this is something that uh, is going to require all of us to be a part of and all of us to benefit from. So not just in the long term, but in the near term. And so I think it's that near term challenge that is the one that is so difficult for us to, uh, to, to get past. Now, some comments were made by, uh, by one of my colleagues uh, a, a little while ago, and, and I think that the statement was, um, those of us who want jobs are going to try to defeat this bill. I am not somebody who's going to try to defeat this bill. I certainly want jobs. I want them in the future, and I want them now for my folks. Um, they need them both now and then. Uh, I do want to find ways, and I believe it can be done, to collaborate to get to those jobs of the future without sacrificing the livelihoods of the people uh, in the process, because that gap in the middle is where we can lose so much. So. That's where, uh, where I come from with respect to, to, uh, to these very complicated issues and challenges we face, but it has to be done. We have to go, we have to go where we, kn we know we need to go and we all agree we should go, but we can't lose people in the process. So um, the first question I have, Secretary Chu, is, is, is regarding coal. Um, of course, you know, about 86 percent of electricity consumed in Ohio and more than half of the country's electricity is produced by coal-fired uh, power plants. Even with aggressive growth scenarios, and your testimony reflects this, for renewable energy combined with energy efficiency measures, coal will still be a major U.S. energy source, at least in the near term and probably in, well into our future. Clean coal technology is critical to address climate change here and abroad, yet there are no commercial scale carbon capture and uh, storage demonstration projects worldwide. Um, Secretary Chu, you've stated that we must develop an inexp inexpensive way to capture and store carbon emissions from coal-fired plants and that U.S. has to take a lead. Uh, the Recovery Act obviously provided significant funding for CCS demonstration projects, but how do you plan, how does the administration plan to accelerate the development of these technologies, including those that offer uh, very high levels of CO2 capture? Well, I think, um, well, what we're doing is the following. We, we've had uh, a, a considerable amount of Economic Recovery Act money, $3.4 in total, uh, devoted towards uh, trying to accelerate the progress on capture and sequestration of uh, uh, carbon from coal. Um, we're moving forward as, as fast as we can. Uh, there's, I'm, I'm having discussions with a number where we've decided to fund a number of, of projects. We're looking forward, uh, very high on my priority. Also, uh, we're looking forward to exploring all the avenues that we think can lead, have a reasonably good chance of leading to um, Deployment, let's say, in the next beginning of deployment, in the last eight, eight years, or, or you know, optimistically even less. So, so right now, 
the technology of what technology we should use is not there. Gasification is a promising technology. We are, would like very much to uh, bring that to a commercial demonstration scale to see if, it, if it's economically viable. But there are other things. We also have to capture carbon at the stack. There are existing coal plants that have just been put up, and those investments, uh, you know, a, a modern coal plant is uh, a couple of billion dollars, and you're not going to turn this, this investment off. And so, uh, and as I said before, China is rapidly expanding uh, their coal facilities. So we have to develop technologies that can capture the carbon uh, at the stack. Right. So we're, we're looking at a myriad of ways. I should also say that uh, very active discussions. Uh, there's roughly 10 projects being considered in Europe, several in Asia, to really collaborate so that our dollars go as far as possible. So this is something very important uh, to the United States. We have the largest coal reserves in, in the world. Thank you, Ms. Sutton. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Like Representative Bono, I have one of the most beautiful districts, at least in North Texas. We have uh, solar. We have research and development at NTEC. We've got an academic research at the uh, University of Texas at Arlington that's on my Fort Worth campus. Wind energy, we manufacture the big windmill blades at a uh, what was formerly an oil field services warehouse up in Gainesville, Texas. We uh, don't have geothermal. We've got a lot of landfill and landfill methane. But my understanding is, well, when you think of state of Texas, we have, we have and have had a fairly robust renewable portfolio standard. We are the leader in wind, en wind energy. Uh, this is, of course, the result of the current governor and the previous governor, Rick Perry and George W. Bush, who made a commitment to wind energy. But Texas produces a lot of energy. So to, in order to meet a percentage in the renewable portfolio standard by, by 2020, uh, even though we're the nation's leader by far in production of wind energy, if we're not able to count the energy that we produce with landfill methane, if we are not able to count uh, pound for pound the amount of carbon dioxide that we save with energy efficiency, then we're going to have a very, very difficult time meeting that energy efficiency standard. Can you address that? Are there ways that we may write the regulations such that we could get credit for what we're doing with energy efficiency? You, Secretary Jackson, you said, Administrator Jackson, you said it was the low-hanging fruit, and uh, I think it's up to 40 percent of the energy we consume now could be saved, but we're going to be restricted on, on how much of that we can count toward our re renewable portfolio standard. Is that correct? Well, uh, I'll speak first. I, I'm not sure about the details of the bill whether um, I mean, this is a, a good point of discussion, whether you can consider if you begin to capture the methane from landfills and from su tru sewage treatment plants, this is methane otherwise that would have escaped in the okay. atmosphere. Let, let me interrupt you, because I only have a limited amount of time. We've made the point for the chairman. I think he heard you. Um, Dr. Chu, you uh, said in response to a question, the United States is losing jobs, losing the, the being the leader in the technology development. Secretary, uh, Administrator Jackson, you said in your testimony that we're going to be producing clean energy jobs, jobs that cannot be shipped overseas, yet Dr. Chu is concerned because many of these solar uh, photovoltaics, many of the wind turbines are manufactured overseas. If we make an enormous investment in solar vo photovoltaic and wind turbines, are those jobs not already shipped overseas? Um, actually, no. Uh, there, there are agreements. But, in fact, uh, Secretary, with all due respect, you answered a question saying we've lost the leadership position in this country because that manufacturing has gone overseas, so we're no longer the leader. Well, I didn't. Uh, I said that the l technology leadership has gone overseas. That the wind turbines were developed overseas, the, the modern wind turbines. But right right now, today, um, the president is in, is in Iowa, on a uh, the second wind producing state. Yes. It, it, well under Texas, let's, for right. the record. But, but my point is that um, uh, it's an old Maytag plant where jobs were lost, uh, but it's now uh, manufacturing uh, the towers for wind turbines. Let, um, 
but still, the point is that those jobs can go overseas. There's nothing in the legislation that I've seen before us that would prevent those jobs. When we make a statement, as was made in the testimony submitted to us, jobs that cannot be shipped overseas, how are you going to ensure that those jobs are not shipped overseas? Are we going to have trade barriers or tariffs? What, what, are, what are going to be the mechanisms that we'll use? So, uh, most people refer to energy efficiency jobs. Uh, those cannot be shipped overseas because energy efficiency work must be done at home. Photovoltaics and wind turbines. Now, renewable sources can certainly go overseas, and some have yep. gone. We are in a race to get them back and to keep them here. Let me uh, let me interrupt because I'm, I'm going to run out of time. And Dr. Chu, I, I, this last question will be for you. We heard Mr. Adonovich talk about the major economic convulsion that perhaps could result from the legislation that we're considering uh, before this committee. Um, we asked, heard Chairman Barton talk, uh, Ranking Member Barton talk about the, uh, how did the oil get so far up north where it's so cold to begin with. Mr. Dingle's gone, Mr. Rogers is gone, but the great Michigan glacier from 15,000, 20,000 years ago actually melted because of global warming. I'll stipulate that warming is happening. But we have not heard from anyone who's come and testified in this committee as to the smoking gun, if you will, that the sine qua non that demonstrates that mankind is responsible for the global warming that is occurring outside and as an aberration outside of naturally occurring solar cycles. So major economic convulsion, yet we lacked the, the, the fundamental piece of evidence that would tell us that this is what we must do because we are, after all, causing the problem to occur. You're a scientist, Dr. Chu. Can you perhaps give some comfort to Mr. Radonovich's constituents and my constituents that we indeed have that missing link, that mankind is responsible for what is occurring? Perhaps the carbon dioxide is going up because the solar cycles have changed and the planet is warming. There is another Burgess, your time plausible expired. explanation. So I will yield to uh, Dr. Chu for an answer. Yeah, well, look, Dr. Chu, you can give an answer and then we have to move on. In, in brief, I, I think the, there is very strong compelling evidence that uh, the lion's share of what we are seeing, the warming that we are seeing, uh, is due to human activity. I would be glad to meet with you and to go over the details of, of what, what that I wish you would. Your NOAA scientist could not provide us that information, so I would very much like to hear it from an expert such as yourself. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez, let me announce as I recognize Mr. Gonzalez, Administrator Jackson, and others on the panel were, uh, were promised they would be able to leave at one, and I regret that all members won't have a chance to ask questions. He will be the last one to ask questions, and then we will proceed with the next panel for those who did not get a chance to ask questions of this panel as the first questioners uh, uh, after, after, for the second panel. Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question will be directed to uh, Secretary LaHood, and it, it's great to see you, and we do miss you. Uh, first of all, the general observation is that, that I, we all believe that as a result of this piece of legislation that the cost of energy will increase and the consumption behavior is going to be modified. Uh, and that is a good thing, actually. And these are, as I have said before, these are not insurmountable obstacles to being responsible in passing a piece of legislation that is reality-based. My concern is going to be more on fossil fuels and the need and the use of them uh, during this transition or conversion period as we adopt new technologies as uh, more efficient vehicles are made available, alternative fuel vehicles, battery-operated uh, motors, and such, because I think that is going to take time. <clears throat> Taking into consideration some of the, the following, um, if we assume that we have a, a fixed number of vehicles now on the road and we have to figure out how many of those are going to be retired, where are we going with sales of vehicles and so on, historically, 15 to 16 million vehicles were sold in the United States. For 2008, that was uh, reduced to about 12 to 13 million. In 2009, it is projected it will be 8 or 9 million. Historically, I guess I call it the shelf life of a vehicle before you turn that over is about 11 years. I, and I don't know where all these, when you put these figures together, where we're, we're going to end up. Because I'm trying to get an idea from Secretary LaHood is how long he thinks this transitional period will occur. Uh, as we gain greater efficiencies and such. 
Uh, we also know that out of all of the millions of cars in the United States, which I've been told 200 million, and, and I'll need to check that, that maybe only 116,000 are powered by natural gas, and that the market share of hybrids comprises no more than 2.2 percent of our entire vehicle, if you want to call it population, in the United States. Taking into account how long the technology, how long it will take the manufacturers to make the vehicles available and such, can we determine the need for the traditional fossil fuels, what I call the transitional or conversion fuel, as we leave one stage of where we presently find ourselves to that which we're trying to attain when it, when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions? Secretary LaHood. Well, we uh, complied with the President's executive order to have a rule that will require the car manufacturers to have a much higher CAFE standard uh, by 2011. And now that that work is done, we are working with EPA and others to try and figure out the path forward be beyond 2011 uh, to develop with car manufacturers and others uh, the idea that we can get to a higher gasoline standard. So the, the direct answer to your question on fuel efficiency, the car manufacturers have to meet a much higher standard on CAFE standards by 2011 in the cars they manufacture. On the battery powered and uh, th they are way ahead of the curve on this. Uh, they are going to be rolling out, uh, GM is going to be rolling out uh, uh, an automobile that uh, is run on batteries. Uh, the hybrid vehicles are taking off, uh, the flex fuel vehicles are taking off, but we know that within the next couple of years, the automob American automobile manufacturers will have automobiles that will be powered by batteries. Okay. And we know that the fuel efficiency standards will be set much higher by 2011 and then even higher than that beyond that. So those are sort of the benchmarks uh, that we are working with with the automobile, American automobile and other automobile. But taken into account, and it does trouble me because I want to support this final piece of legislation, that we are not dealing with realistic expectations of what are, uh, the manufacturers will be able to provide out there for a willing and able buyer. Uh, we are not factoring in the economic hard times for the next few years because I think they are going to be there and people retaining their cars longer periods of time, manufacturers not being able to even meet the needs uh, of vehicles that are tr uh, totally more efficient. But if they are, they are probably going to be hybrid, meaning they still have an internal combustion engine that is going to be run with traditional fossil fuels. That doesn't mean we are throwing in the towel and giving up on this endeavor. All I am saying is let's be realistic about the need for a domestic production and refining capacity in the United States. Mr. Secretary, in looking at energy independence when it comes to fuels, do we need to increase or decrease domestic production and refining capacity of fossil fuels in the United States in the foreseeable future? Well, look, I, I can't be specific in answering that question, but it's it's something that uh, everyone is, uh, you know, investigating, looking into, debating, and uh, the, but the, I, I don't have a specific answer for that at this point. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gonzalez. Uh, I want to thank our three uh, witnesses. Uh, you've been very, very helpful to us and and patient in answering the questions. And we thank you so much for your input. And we'll look forward to working with you on this legislation. Thank you. Mr. Markey.